What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of The Sit Down. As always, if you enjoy this video, do me a favor, hit the like button below and let me know what you think in the comments section. Also, if you're new around here, you just haven't done it yet or living under a rock, I don't know what you're waiting for. Hit that subscribe button below now so you never miss another sit down video. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to get into another mafia topic. And over the years in American mafia history, there is no mobster in history more paranoid than Anthony Gaspipe Casso. He would kill you on the sheer belief that he had that you may have been an informant. There may have been no evidence, but it was really in his head. This continued paranoia would be a major issue for most of his mob career, and it would culminate in him not only killing mobsters, but attempting to kill the family members of mobsters on the sheer belief that by silencing them, they would go away. No mobster has taken the wrath more over the career of Anthony Casso than his old friend, Fat Peter Kyoto, a hawking individual that was a huge earner, accomplished killer. And in the end, the biggest problem Anthony Casso would face, the story of Fat Peter Kyoto. Next. On sit down shorts. Fat Peter Kyoto was born in 1951 in the Brooklyn neighborhood of Bensonhurst. He would come up running the streets of the famed borough that has made mobsters like Sammy Gravano and other folks in that life. Now, for Fat Pete Kyoto, it was said that really since birth, he had a weight problem. He was always the biggest kid on the playground. And for a lot of his youth, his disability, according to him, was a problem. He didn't move like the other kids. He was bullied. But the bullying quickly stopped when fat Peter Kyoto started using his weight as a positive. He began being the bully. And he began saying that if you fuck with me, I will beat you to the ends of the earth, basically. And that's exactly what fat Peter Kyoto did. He turned the issue of his weight positive. Like I said, he was always the big kid. And as he got older, he used his weight and his brashness. At one point, Peter Kyoto was about six foot five, 420 pounds. He was the perfect enforcer for mob families. And the group like the Lucchese family quickly realized that. Now, he would actually start out, Fat Pete, selling drugs, and he was actually arrested several times in the 70s uh, on different narcotics charges. In 1975, Fat Peter Kyoto would plead guilty in New York State Court on robbery and weapons charges, and he would do a little over a year in New York State Prison. By the late 70s, he had become associated with a new pal, Anthony Casso. Now, as we know, Anthony Casso got his start very much stealing, and he would eventually get involved with cargo hijacking out of Kennedy Airport. That's where Fat Peter Kyoto would meet Anthony Casso. And Fat Pete would actually be arrested in 1979 on federal interstate cargo hijacking charges and actually do about two years in federal prison. So early on in Fat Pete's life, he was pretty unlucky with the government and with state police. He was arrested several times and did about three years in prison during the 70s. Now, one thing Fat Peter Kyoto was particularly good at was uh, he was a great enforcer. In fact, um, he thrived in debt collection tactics. Look, the truth of the matter was, if you owed money to the Lucchese crime family, the last person you wanted to see was a six foot five, 420 pound individual. Anthony Casa would actually say at one point, he had truly believed that Fat Pete, quote, enjoyed breaking bones and truly hurting people. Um, and he talked about the fact that when Fat Peter Kyoto came to you to collect a loan debt or a gambling debt, he would beat you senselessly. And he would constantly have bruising on his hands and on his fingers. And that when you screwed with him, he would beat you to the point where you wouldn't walk for weeks on end. He relished in beating people up. He was the perfect enforcer. He was the perfect big man. 
Uh, he would ultimately make his way into becoming a hitter as well. And it was said that during the career of Fat Pete Kyoto, uh, you had to use more than one hand in identifying how many people Fat Peter Kyoto killed. Now, Fat Pete was not just a leg breaker and an enforcer. He would ultimately make his way up the ranks of the Lucchese crime family and started making more and more money. Fat Pete was very much involved with waste carting and in the garbage industry. And he would make himself a very rich man because of it. Through the 80s, he would become connected through a longtime friend, Ali Shades Malangone, who, as we know, was integral with the Genovese family with waste carting and garbage pickup. He and Malangone became very connected with an individual called Salvatore Butara. Now, Butaro was from uh, Cobble Hill in Brooklyn and ultimately moved to Bensonhurst in the 70s and met Malangone and Fat Pete Kyoto. Throughout the 80s, uh, Butaro owned and was the sole shareholder of a company called Smith uh, Waste Management. He basically used Malangone and Fat Pete Kyoto as um, ways to earn bids and contracts and use their panache to basically win over the garbage industry. Now, through Fat Peter's connection to Bataro, he made hundreds of thousands of dollars winning back kickbacks in the garbage industry. Now, Fat Peter Kittle also owned a landfill in New Jersey, and it allowed him to become not only uh, very connected in the Lucchese crime family, but a very rich man. Now, we'll get into some of the other industry connections that Fat Pete had. Ultimately, he would move to the area of Grassmere in Staten Island, where he had a beautiful home at 118 Overlook Terrace in a cul-de-sac overlooking that very river uh, or lake in Staten Island. So he lived in a very trendy neighborhood. In fact, he actually was neighbors with Ali Shades. They were both very rich people. And the rich guys in these families stuck together. Now, if you know anything about Ali Shades, obviously he was very close with Fat Pete, but he was also very close with Jimmy Brown Failure, uh, the king of garbage for the Gambino crime family. In my estimation, in the 80s, we could make the case that Malangone, Kyoto, and Failure were three of the richest people as far as earners in some of these families. They were big time earners. Uh, now, Fat Peter Kyoto would ultimately become a made man in the Lucchese crime family officially in 1987. He would be made inside a Queens funeral parlor. And within a year, he had his own crew. He operated out of a social club on McDonald Avenue in Brooklyn. And for Fat Pete, it was not just waste hauling that he was involved with. Not only was he involved with all the similar mafia rackets, but he was also very involved with the Lucchese crime family in overtaking the local iron workers union 580. Now for Fat Pete Kyoto, this would ultimately become one of the biggest rackets that the Lucchese crime family would be involved in. As we know, in the late 80s, uh, particularly around 87, 88, 89, the Genovese family and the Lucchese family primarily were involved in a scheme involving the installation of new windows throughout the 335 housing projects that New York City offers. Let's basically just look at that photo right there. Think of all the windows in about 20 complexes. Now remember, there were 335 New York City owned housing projects. The federal government was involved with this as well as this New York state government. And they were involved in contracts. The mob would take over those contracts and basically install a tax of a dollar to two dollars on every window involved in this installation. And the Lucchese crime family was said to be the chief family involved with this. Now, all the families benefited, the Gambinos, the Columbos, all the families benefited, but it was the Lucchese crime family that benefited most. Now, the chief leader of the group for the Lucchese's was Fat Peter Kyoto. Now, Kyoto would work directly with an individual called Peter Savino. Now, Savino was a Genovese associate. He was very involved with Local 580. Now, one of the main people involved with the collection of the money for the Lucchese cry family was union steward John Sonny Morrissey, seen on the right 
of Peter Savina. Now, Morrissey was a very involved at Local 580, and he would be the one that would get all the money for people like Victor Amuso and Anthony Casso, who had by this point become the boss and underboss of the Lucchese crime family. So for Fat Peter Chieto, he had money coming in from all different ways. He had the Windows contracts. He had uh, Local 580. He had garbage. He had extortion. He had bookmaking. He had loan checking. His crew was one of the biggest and best in the Lucchese crime family. And for him, he had a great relationship with the boss of the family, Anthony Casso. In fact, they were regularly seen... Uh, in photos together. These guys were two peas in a pod. And it was funny when we'd see uh, Casso and uh, uh, Kyoto walking down the street. Now, obviously, Kyoto was the hawking man uh, on tape. But in this case, the hawking man was actually Casso. It was good to know Anthony Casso. He wanted to be on the right side of history involving Casso. Now, for Kyoto, he would find very quickly that eventually he would be on the wrong side of Anthony Casso. Now, obviously, the Windows case would take on kind of a case of its own. It was a huge case. And this would ultimately bring down a lot of people in all sorts of different families. It, by 1989, he's very involved, Kyoto. He's the point man in the Lucchese crime family. And as we know, with Anthony Casso, he becomes very paranoid. Around this time, uh, the federal government starts intervening on the Windows case, and they solely start to arrest people. One of the people that becomes worrisome to Kyoto and Casso is John Sonny Marcy, a man who was very connected with Peter Savino, who had been arrested, Casso believes that John Sonny Morrissey may cooperate. Now, it is important to understand there is no evidence that Sonny Morrissey was an informant. He never cooperated as far as I know and have been able to find. Now, when Casso wants someone dead, he instructs someone to be dead. He goes to Kyoto and says, look, you got to get rid of Sonny Morrissey. He's a problem. You know it and I know it. And if he cooperates, you're fucked. You're our guy here. So he instructs Kyoto to get a hit team together and go whack Sonny Morrissey. Now, Morrissey would be easy to kill because he was very close with not only Casso, not only Kyoto, but Vic Amuso as well. They, on September 17th, 1989, instruct Sonny Morrissey to come to a home in New Jersey. Now, Kyoto instructs his chief hitter in his crew Richie the Toupee Pagliarulo, and a man called Thomas Carew, Tommy Irish, to handle the hit. They get Marcy to come to the home and basically at one point pull a gun out and begin shooting him. At one point, Marcy would exclaim, quote, I'm not a rat. They just keep shooting him. Eventually, one of the guns would jam and they finished him off eventually and Marcy was killed. Now, according to the government, Big Mike DeSantis was actually involved with the burial of Sonny Marcy. So Sonny Marcy was eliminated. He had to be, according to Casa. Now, ultimately, as I said, Sonny Marcy was never said to become an informant. But for Peter Kyoto, he would have to understand that at some point he was going to have to deal with the Windows case. He ultimately would. He'd be indicted in 1991. Now, his lawyers basically would tell him that not only would you have RICO charges stemming from the Windows case, but um, you were already indicted on other racketeering charges. And as we had saw with other people involved with high profile government cases, his lawyers would tell him basically if he went to trial and lost, Fat Pete would get life in prison. Now, for Kyoto, he decides to make a rash decision and say, look, I'm just going to plead guilty. I'll probably get 10 years uh, and that'll be that. I'll be out quickly, eight and a half. I'll be good to go. The problem, though, as we know with Casso, you don't just plead without consulting with him. Casso goes nuclear. He's furious. He instructs little Al Diarco on a payphone where little Al accepted it at the Kennedy airport to basically get rid of Kyoto. Casso assumed that by pleading, he was a rat. He was going to cooperate, and that was that. And Casso knew Kyoto was a problem. If Casso cooperated against him, that would be that. Now, Casso had other problems, but Kyoto would have a major problem. So he goes from being a friend and confidant to, I want him fucking dead. 
Now, Diarco would talk about this in his book that he wavered and had trouble with this. He knew, you know, Kyoto was not a rat. He just didn't want to go to jail for life and felt like a plea was the right idea. Uh, he was instructed. Amuso and Casa were paranoid. They wanted big, fat Peter Chiodo dead. Now, it wouldn't be easy, though. The problem for those folks was Chiodo was an, uh, an assassin himself. He wasn't stupid. He knew that he was probably going to be a marked man, and he had plans to eventually leave Staten Island. But it was said that Fat Pete would really never leave his home. He knew the writing on the wall, and you know if he did leave, he would have to be heavily guarded the problem was at eventually he would have to leave. And his plan for Pat Pete was he was going to go up to upstate New York and hide out for a while until he was sent to prison. On May 8th, uh, 1991, Kyoto decides to leave. Before he leaves, he realizes he has to get his car serviced to get an oil change. He pulls his white Cadillac to a service station on Fingerboard Road and Bay Street in Staten Island, not far from his home and not far from the Staten Island Expressway. Once he hits the expressway, he's out. But he has to do that one thing like we all have to do, get our car serviced. He pulls the car in. He's talking to the mechanic with the hood up when he spots two shooters shooting at the service station. One of the shooters, little Al's son, Joe DiArco, discussed that he shot many times at the service station. Fat Pete pulls his 9 millimeter out and begins firing back. Now, eventually, they would hit Kyoto not once, not twice, not five, not ten, but 12 times. And for the first time in Peter Kyoto's life, being absolutely gigantic saves him. His blubbery fat blocked his arteries in a way. He was credited, the doctor said that him being immensely obese saved him in this case. And in fact, at one point, they had just assumed he was dead. They had shot him 12 times and left. He was rushed to a Staten Island hospital and was mended back to health. Now, this did not stop Anthony Casso. Anthony Casso instructed a hitman called John Fortuna to get into the hospital and take out the heavily guarded Kyoto. Now, Fortuna would actually get into the hospital and get onto the same floor of fat Pete Kyoto, but he got within eyesight of Kyoto and was arrested. So Casso did whatever he had to do. He knew that he needed to kill Kyoto by any means necessary. Now, again, sending a hitman, sending people to shoot him 12 times, it did not stop Casso. He would not stop there. On March 10th, 1992, Casso made the no no mistake. He started going after the family of Fat Peter Kyoto. On March 10th, 1992, in the area of 1762 West 7th Street in Brooklyn, the sister of Kyoto, Patricia Capazzolo, had just returned home at about 7.40 a.m. after she dropped her kids off to a school in Gravesend. She returned home. Little did she know that for the last month or so, she had been stalked by an individual called Michael Spinelli, a Lucchese hitter. He, alongside an individual called Dino Basciano, stalked Capazzolo to uh, her home, jumped out of a van with ski masks, and lit Mrs. Capazzolo up. She was shot multiple times and seen on the ground screaming in pain. She'd be hit in the neck, the back, everywhere. But again, she survived. Miraculously, the woman survived. What a tough woman she was. This is the grave mistake Casso continued making. And this is what sets Casso apart from a lot of other people. His paranoia set in and he began doing things that are a complete no-no in the mafia. Now for Capazzola, she would spend, from what I understand, the rest of her life in a wheelchair and would move to Canada. She moved away from this area, America, she was out. She was gone. And the New York Daily News would have this on the front page. Now Mob Hits Mom was the title. And that's really where the worst parts of the mob came. This, this is where they became just out of control. Now, Michael Spinelli would ultimately get 19 years in federal prison for this hit. He would actually be released in 2020. 
uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, Spinelli said he's a changed man and wants to be a yoga instructor. He became, uh, had an affinity for yoga inside. Now, for uh, Fat P. Kyoto, the assault on his family would not stop. In 1993, uh, an uncle of Fat P. Kyoto, Frank Signorio, would be found dead inside a car in East New York, Brooklyn. His body would be discovered frozen after he was reported missing. So Casso not only tried to shoot Kyoto 12 times, not only tried to kill him in the hospital, not only tried to kill his sister and killed his uncle, Kyoto still testified. He ultimately would give uh, Casso a life sentence, even after Casso flipped as well. He would ultimately testify in other court cases involving the Windows case and others. Fat Pete Kyoto would um, ultimately head to witness protection where he would live until 2016 and die at the age of 65. When we look back on the Lucchese crime family, Fat Peter Kyoto was one of the more interesting individuals. He grew up as a whale-like individual that he used that to really terrorize people. He became a huge earner, one of high stature. He lived in Staten Island, was a capo in the Lucchese crime family, was very close with one of the biggest maniacs in the history of the mob. And ultimately, through just trying to protect himself and take the right initiative, he was made into a rat. He wasn't a rat, ultimately became one. But can you blame Fat Pete Kyoto? Look, in the end, I can't say I'd be incredibly sorry for Fat Pete, but we have to say, do you blame him? Would you do life for Anthony Casso? I sure as hell wouldn't. In the end, every informant has to be dealt with differently. Did they cooperate? How did they cooperate? And who ultimately did they put in jail? I got to tell you, though, I'm not shedding any tears for Anthony Casso. In the end, Kyoto had to deal with unspeakable tragedy. But we have to ask ourselves, how much tragedy did he bring upon other families as well? In the end, this is a deceitful world, and you're never friends with anyone for too long. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit the like button. And make sure you subscribe so you never miss an episode of Sit Down Shorts. We'll see you next time here on the show.